Hello, and welcome to PSENG True Diversity Film Series, Standing in Solidarity. My name is Donna Walker Kuhn. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm Senior Advisor, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at New Jersey Performing Arts Center. This evening, we're pleased to host an important discussion. Race is a construct, its origins, implications, and application. I hope you were able to view the documentary, How the Racial Wealth Gap Was Created, from the three-part docu-series called Race, The Power of Illusion. And I would like to extend a special thank you to our arts education team who curated the panel discussion this evening. This social justice series is part of our Standing on Solidarity initiative. The purpose of this series is to bring our community together and to encourage everyone to take part in the movement to ensure civil rights for all. On our website, you can find archived prior social justice panel discussions, as well as resources that will help you take action. We're also very happy to have as our advisors the Newark NAACP, the New Jersey Institute for Social Justice, Newark Arts, the Truth and Racial Healing and Transformation Center at Rutgers University in Newark, the Africana Institute at Essex County College, uh, the Asian American Arts Alliance, and ACLU New Jersey. Now, NJ Path would like to offer a land acknowledgement. The language we're using was created with consultation and guidance from Chief Dwayne Perry of the Rampopo Lenape Muncie tribe and Oleana Whispering Dove of the Eastern Salagi Algonquin descendants. We're grateful to them for the generosity, wisdom, and labor to craft these words. We the Lenape, original benefactors of land once ripened and cultivated with attentiveness to the creator and her ascendancy, express everlasting gratitude to our creator for the traditional ancestral jurisdictions of the Muncie, Asopus, Canarsie, Capsi, Werpoes, Silinoi, and Wikisqueak, jointly known today as the Rampopo, Natakote, Lene, Lenape. We are the Lenape hoking today and will be for the remaining days of tomorrow, keepers of the past. Let this moment of recognition be a monument of action. Let it be the beginning of hope for this, our turtle island, and for the Rampopo Lenape, the Muncie people of whose land we now trod. Here on this land, in this place of the Muncie, we acknowledge our debt to those who have come before us, to those who have been denigrated and suffered for the sake of cultural and land appropriation. Let this land acknowledgement be the beginning of our return to unity. Let us be guardians of the water, the air, and the earth, the four-legged, the flyers, the swimmers, the crawlers, the mammal people and the green. Let us now stand lifting our humanity and rapturing with Earth's consciousness as guardians of harmony and kindness. I would like to welcome our PSENG spokesperson for this evening. PSENG are our corporate sponsors for Standing on Solidarity since its inception. Janine Houston is the Enterprise Manager, Diversity, Equity uh, and Inclusion for PSCNG Services. Uh, Janine is a certified diversity professional working as the enterprise manager of diversity and equity uh, and inclusion at PSCNG. She's responsible for planning, developing, and facilitating industry best practices that improve inclusion and employee engagement within the utility company. And her goal is to drive positive cultural change and workplace behaviors through strategies and programming aligned with the company's mission, vision, and values. Welcome, Janine, and thank you. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, Donna. It is an honor to be here with you and the community today. Good evening and welcome to all that are on today's Zoom call and, and welcome to tonight's discussion. I am Janine Houston, Enterprise Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Manager for Public Service Enterprise Group, also known as PSEG. We are proud sponsors of the PSEG True Diversity Film Series and partners with NJPAC. PSEG, rooted in Newark for over 120 years, 
strongly supports NJPAC and has done so since first opening its doors almost 25 years ago. We recognize NJPAC as an anchor cultural institution in this community. And PSCG and the PSCG True Diversity Film Series represents the best outgrowth of that relationship. This film series reflects PSCG's commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion in Newark and beyond. Public service is in our name, and we are more than just the power company. As citizens of Newark and New Jersey, we are dedicated to supporting organizations like NJPAC, promoting increased access to resources in education and the arts. Amidst conversations on race and social justice, PSEG invests millions of dollars and initiates projects for equal treatment in our company, our community, and our nation. In 2023, we hosted our second annual Juneteenth event sponsored by PSEG's employee-led Pan-African Leadership Forum, also known as Prolific ERG. Our employee leadership team brought together PSEG leaders from Long Island and New Jersey to engage our workforce in a meaningful discussion on the relevance of Juneteenth in the 21st century. Juneteenth Memorial events are a part of our DEI signature event series, which continues to celebrate the diverse cultural heritage reflected in our workforce, promoting inclusion and belonging for all of our employees. As we model inclusive behaviors for our workforce, we empower our employees to translate their inclusive experience into more effective and engaging interactions with our customers and community stakeholders. While there's more work ahead, PSEG is making positive strides in leading purposeful discussions, raising awareness, and inspiring advocacy for change. As a community, we impact each other. We at PSEG envision ourselves as an active corporate citizen in the, within this community. That's why it is essential that we work in unity toward building equity, compassion, and respect across New Jersey. Together, we have the power to take care of each other. Thank you for joining us tonight. Enjoy the discussion. And with that, Donna, I turn it back into your capable hands. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, I'd like to now introduce our moderator for this amazing discussion we're going to have this evening. Angela Omwachi Willick is going to moderate this discussion. And Dr. Omwachi Willick is Dean and the Ryan Walk Gallo Professor of Law at Boston University School of Law. She's a renowned legal scholar and expert in employment discrimination law critical race theory, affirmative action, and family law. She's an elected member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the American Law Institute, and College of Labor and Employment Lawyers. She's also a fellow of the American Bar Foundation and the Iowa Bar Foundation. Thank you so much and welcome. Thank you so much, Donna. Thank you for that lovely introduction. Thank you for allowing me to moderate this amazing conversation with these brilliant, brilliant panelists. Welcome to Race as a Social Construct. I'm Angela Mwachi Willig. My pronouns are she, her, and we are just excited to launch uh, into this conversation. But first, we'll allow each one of the panelists to introduce themselves very, very briefly. So I'll start first with Professor Uju Agarwal. Hi. Um... Thank you so much, uh, Angela, and um, thank you to all the organizers today for this conversation. Um, really important conversation that I'm so glad we are having and we need more of. So by way of introduction, I'm an assistant pre professor um, at the New School um, of Anthropology and Experiential Learning. I'll say today that I'm drawing on a few different sites of work. I'm trained as a cultural anthropologist, um, but also as a community organizer and popular educator. 
I spent over two decades building organizations and projects that work to advance racial justice, educational justice, immigrant rights, anti-imperialism, and abolition. Um, I'm really looking forward to learning and thinking together this evening, and my hope for tonight's panel is that we think broadly and specifically about the ways that race, racism, and power intersect but are not predetermined, about the connections between the local and the global, and that through dialogue, we continue to expand our understanding and commitments to freedom as an unfinished and always collective project. So thank you, and I'm really glad to be here. Fantastic, thank you so much. Uh, next, I'd like to welcome Dr. Jean-Pierre Brutus. Thank you so much, Angela, and thank you to NJ Pack for having me tonight, and thank you to my fellow panelists for allowing me to be part of this important discussion. I am a senior counsel at the New Jersey Institute for Social Justice, and I am also the convener of the New Jersey Reparations Council. Prior to coming to the Institute, I represented tenants facing eviction um, as part of New York City's right to counsel. I work for legal service in New York City. And before that, I studied African-American studies at Northwestern University. And I raised that because one of the reasons why I went to graduate school and pursue a PhD in African-American studies was to think critically about race as a social construct. And I had the privilege and honor of studying under Dr. Barnard Hesse, who was thinking about race in a new kind of way. And I also got to engage in study under the philosopher Charles Mills. And it was through that learning I got to think critically about race. And so here's an opportunity to talk about some of those ideas publicly and the ways it manifests in creating inequality. And I would like for the audience to think about the long history and the long arc of race, but also to think about the man-made nature of race and racism and the material aspects of racism, race, race and racism. And to think about the possibilities that if race and racism were synthetic and man-made, and then they could be rearranged and gotten rid of, away with because they're man-made. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, it's my great delight to introduce director and poet, Sarah Munjak. Hi, yes, thank you so much, Angela, and everyone who helped put this together. I'm really just so honored to be here and have this really important conversation. Um, so I'm the director of marketing and DEI partnerships at Consciously Unbiased, which is an organization that works towards workplace equity um, as Angela mentioned, I'm also a poet, um, the founder and host of Jersey City Reads Poems, uh, which centers marginalized voices here in Jersey City, the community where I've lived for the past six years. And as someone who's in the thick of the extremely polarized DEIB space, I'm hoping that I can speak towards what to do when we are in an environment of such polarization, um, especially with elections coming up and even just whether it be political or personal, although the personal is political, um, and really speak towards how to have difficult conversations and how to have sticky conversations, essentially how we can talk about systems of racism being more oppressive than folks even realize, especially folks who've never had to think about it before, and how to really have a conversation with folks who haven't had to think about it before in a way that leads us more towards a place of progress and solutions um, rather than continuing this divisive climate that we're in. So I'm hoping that I can give some tools for that or some insight into um, some ways to navigate that. Thank you so much. And last but not least, I'm thrilled to introduce Professor George Shulman. There we go. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Angela. Thank you, uh, NJ Pack. Um, I am um, a college professor for the last uh, 40 years, actually, as of last year. And I retired last year. And when I look back on what inspired or animated my teaching, um, it is it comes out of my own experience politically in the late 60s and 70s. And that has animated my teaching and my way of teaching and my 
participation tonight. I have lived through a time of great hope and then 40 years of retrenchment, basically. And my concern as a teacher all these years has been to turn students on, to have those difficult conversations, as Sarah mentioned, and to bring them into, deeply into, the darker and crazier, uh, but also wildly creative energies that animate American politics in such a way that they can feel themselves able to enter and engage um, that politics. Um, and then the second thing that really strikes me looking back is that probably the thing I'm most proud of in, in my experience as a teacher was being a founding faculty member of the NYU Prison Education Initiative, which took NYU classes into um, a, a prison upstate uh, where incarcerated men could earn NYU credits. Uh, and then upon release, complete BAs uh, downtown. And the idea of working across kinds of walls that have divided the society has really been very meaningful to me. And I think, I hope our conversation tonight can be and can contribute to that kind of effort. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. As you can probably tell from these wonderful introductions, you are in for a real treat. This will be a very stimulating and uh, really, really, really informative discussion. Um, it'll be a free-flowing discussion. Our panelists will jump in at any particular point. I'll ask questions. And we also encourage you to type in your questions in the Q&A section, or if you put it in, uh, put, type it in in the Q&A section. So I'll start with the first question. The first question is um, really before we get too deeply into discussions about race as a social construct and talking about how racism actually operates in our society, it would be really nice to have some kind of foundation to understand how is it that most people in our society understand race and racism? So how would you say that most people commonly think of the terms race and racism? Sure, I'll jump in. So I think um, most folks, I think, you know, in terms of how it's popular, underst properly understood or conventionally understood is that race can be s seen visually because it is biological. It is seen on people's bodies, right? And that one can s simply look at someone and they can decide by looking at certain attributes, particularly on one's face, that they can then determine the person's race, where they come from, what language they speak, right? A whole host of things just by looking at someone's face. And so I think the popular understanding is that not only is race biological, but it's embedded in people's DNA. And in that DNA, that then follows that we can tell how that person will act, the outcomes, their IQ, their behaviors, right? So a whole host of things, there is a causality between DNA that is embedded in race and then how people live their lives. I think that's usually um, how it's popularly understood. Would anyone want, like to add anything? Yeah, I would add that it's popularly understood as a way of differentiating people and usually ranking them as well. And so you, you, you get the idea of inherent, essential, fixed, unchanging characteristics. And you can say something like the Jew, the Black, the Hispanic, something like the way Donald Trump typically talks about people that he characterizes as essentially defined by the, a group that they're identified with. And I think that language is very prevalent, even among people who object to being ranked lower than others, they may still adhere to a certain idea that there's essential group qualities 
that appear phenotypically. So many people think of race as being biological. They really associate it with the visual, the physical. Osagi Obasaki, who's a professor at the University of California, Berkeley School of Law, really wrote a fantastic book where he talks about how even blind people, a study where he did interviewing blind people, even think of race as visually. The descriptions of race, even from people who could not necessarily see the physical characteristics, also thought of race as visually, to tell us something about how we're taught about race. And people often use race as proxies for making judgments about um, other individuals, differentiating them. Um, and that's one of the ways in which it plays out in our society. And what about racism? Sure, I'm happy to jump in there. I mean, I employ a definition of racism um, that understands, I think, as you were gesturing, Jean-Pierre, um, racism is operating as a material force that's structured and reproduced by power, grounded in violence that dispossesses and, and excludes in order to extract value and profit. So this is where I think for me, Ruth Wilson Gilmore's definition of racism is very useful. Um, quote, racism is a state sanctioned or extra legal production and exploitation of group differentiated vulnerability to premature death. And I'll say it again, because it's a lot of words. <laughs> Um, racism is a state sanctioned or extra legal production and exploitation of group differentiated vulnerability to premature death. So in thinking about racism like this, then we can see that racism is also produced over time in places not distinct from, but in relation to power and contingent upon regimes of accumulation, settler colonialism, slavery, indenture, extraction, but also border making and partition. And absent, of course, then is also any reference to phenotype but a definition that is capacious and helps us track over time and across space, both locally and globally, the processes that produce hierarchical group differentiation, not difference, right? But also how those, how that production is linked to power, place, resources, and the social relations that we make and remake amongst ourselves. So most of us grow up thinking about race in a much less complex way, right? Most of us are taught as children that race is about hating people of a, who are identified with a particular group or who are perceived as belonging to a particular group. And yet it's way more complex as uh, uh, Uju just pointed out. Um, there are many, many dimensions that it's linked to power, it's linked to place, it's linked to, um, it's state sanctioned. There are a variety of things, it's structural, and we will get more into that discussion in a minute. So now that we have just a sense of how most people commonly think about race, um, what is race? What is it actually? And, and how is race different from racism? Sure, so I'll start us off and I wanna start off a little bit uh, differently than, you know, maybe some how many of you have been taught to think about race as a social construct. I want to give you a story, really an allegory. And I want to be clear at the outset, it's an allegory about how race developed, but I hopefully it's a way to meet, to be, make it more accessible. So I'll start off with the story and you'll follow along and I'll explain some key parts for you. Imagine I, you were invited to a house party during the summer. Maybe it's a barbecue, right? And at the person's house, the home of the host, there are people playing board games. And the re part of the reason why folks are playing this board game is because uh, the host has decided that folks are going to play this board game. Maybe the host might be a little bit drunk, um, and there might be a little bit of hint of violence um, that the host is sort of alluding to. And the host just randomly decides what the rules are going to be, who is going to play, what players are going to be on what team, who can make what moves, when they can make them, how they can make them, what pieces they're allowed to use as part of the game to represent themselves. The host is not only the creator of the game, but also one of the players of the game and chooses what piece to represent themselves. So the, the rules are just made up as they go along, right? 
They might write down some of the rules, not all of the rules, but the host imposes those rules on the fellow players. And they follow the, the they follow these rules because the host might be given to occasional outburst, mostly verbal abuse, but sometimes even sometimes physical abuse. So towards the end of the night, as the game goes along, the host wants to memorialize the game so they can write down the rules by hand, the ones that they came up with. They write down the rules, but not all the rules are written down. Some of them are miswritten. In the future, players who come back to the house decide to play the game, but they play the game in the ways in which they were originally put in. Maybe they, the pieces were associated with where they were in the house. So those who were near the kitchen were associated with the kitchen team, or those who were near the swimming pool were associated with the swimming pool team, or those who were near uh, the barbecue or associated with the barbecue team. They begin to refer to themselves as the kitchen team or as the barbecue team or as a swimming pool team, because that is the way in which they begin to find they can move along in the game and how they are recognized by the host. They begin to know the rules so well, they don't even refer to the, to the rule sheet. The game begins to feel almost natural, almost instinctual. Later in the, in the, game, in the, in the, in the future, the rules of the game suffer some wear and tear, some smudging, and then the rules can't be found. Folks add different rules to the game. These become part of the game itself. Some are other original rules are forgotten. There are new players added to the game. One year later, when the game and the host are played again, some acquaintances who feel more strongly begin to ask questions about the game. Why is the host both the player and the organizer of the game? Why does the host have the ability to move around so freely when the other pieces do not, when the other pieces are constrained by the rules made by the host? Some of these new players also begin to ask questions about the game, about what they consider to be an inherently flawed process that allows unfair advantage to this host. Those who have been playing for a long time have kind of overlooked these questions and these dimensions. That right there is an allegory for thinking about how race was created and reproduced from the initial colonial encounter between Europe and the Americas. The host, the position who is both the creator and the position who is part of the game, we can think of that as what we come to be called Europeans and what call, comes to be called whiteness. Whiteness is both part of the racial hierarchy, but also the one that creates the racial hierarchy. It is the, that which has a capacity to impose naming. So for example, the anthropologist Eric Wolf points out in his work, Europe and the People of History, that categories of Indian and Negro were categories imposed on African populations, category of Negro, and the category of Indian um, populations conquered in the Americas to represent a particular kind of power relationship between Europe, Europeans who colonized those populations and a way of distinguishing between their political situation, right? And the differences between religion, territory, language, politics, economics of those they conquered. What happens over time is that that becomes color coded and the body becomes the, priv the, the privileged site of race. The relations of power that prop up the body, so where people focus on the visual and only focus on people's bodies and how they look, they forget all the power that made that possible. So when scientists in the 19th century, philosophers are looking out at the colonial world, which is a, they're looking at colonial world, they think there's they give a biological and scientific explanation for a political category. And so when folks are looking at someone and they're saying, I can see this person's biological race, as my, as Barnard Hesse would say, race does not have a biological ancestry, but a colonial ancestry. And I will leave you with this before I give it up to my other, other panelists. Many of you hopefully have seen the film Roots, the original. And there's a particularly poignant scene in that, in that movie. When Kunta Quinte, Kunta Quinte is up on the whipping post and he's being beaten by the, the enslaver. And then slaver and say, Kunta, right? He's saying, he's saying your name is Toby. He's saying, Toby, Toby. And Kunta Kinte is saying, no, Kunta, Kunta. In that setting, in that moment, everything that Kunta represents, 
the underlying violence that is taken to impose the name Kunta on to on or sorry to be on Kunta Kinte, right? Everything that Toby represents, the power, the naming, the force, the colonial imposition, that is race. That is reproduced over time again and again in different kinds of ways throughout the Americas. And everything that Kunta Kinte is rebelling against is rebelling against the colonial imposition, right? That is what happens with race and how it's manufactured, reproduced. I had said, excuse me, I had said man, man made earlier, I should say human made, synthetic. And yet that is not taken into account when we're talking about race by many folks who will talk about how European philosophers are thinking about race. We should think about how the colonial administrators created it materially on the ground in the Americas and how afterwards during the enlightenment, European thinkers were taking into account a colonial world. So when they were creating hierarchies, this was already created through material conditions on the ground through colonialism, through slavery. And so I'll leave it to you with that. Um, but now, even in our current worlds, right, when you see someone say racial profiling, that is the reproduction of race. The reproduction of race is when the police go out and they racially profile black people. They are recreating race in that moment over and over again in those instances. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Does anyone have anything they want to add? I love Let the vision. Think... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go. I, I, I would... I would just add to that wonderful allegory and its actual historical referent, the fact that race and racism are inseparably tied together and that race is a for, it is an invention, a construct that over time is naturalized, but its function is, as Uju mentioned earlier through Ruth Gilmore, its function is to differentiate people in it to subordinate and exploit and render people unequal um and and so you can't have race without racism because its function is domination um much as we naturalize it and think it's it's actually a fact in the i mean it is a fact in the world but it is not a natural fact. Yes. Others? Anyone else want to, to? I really love the idea of the game host creating different racial categories. And one of the ways in we can, which we can show that race is a social construct is like that those categories differ. They're not, they would be constant if race were a real, a, a, a real, um, biological, genetic, uh, you know, factor, those things would be constant anywhere. And yet different game hosts, as you pointed out, have defined race differently and racial groups differently in different areas all over the world, right? So I really like that that use of the, of the allegory for a lot of different reasons. And the way the rules get constructed are constructed for to now allow the game host to continue to win the game, continue to control the game. And so it's a really wonderful allegory um uh, uh as well and I, and um so tell us a little bit of, we're talking about how race can't be separated from racism right that that race is you know created so that racism can be perpetuated so people could be subordinated oppressed all of those things what is the work that race has done um, uh, in our society what is it currently doing in our society um how would you define different kinds of racism right there are lots of different complexities and how do we see racism at work in our society? Um, and I would say even, I know we've talked a little bit about, uh, about you know, politics and politically why it's so important. Why is it important in this particular moment for uh, those around us, everyone in our society to have clear understandings of race and racism uh, and how they function and operate? Sure, I can um, begin to um, kick us off thinking about that. Um, and I mean, one thing that I that I try and center in thinking about this question a little bit is um, 
how we think about continuity um, uh, over time, how things stay the same or not, um, how those categories shift and change and or not and why, and what are particularly the realignments that come into shape during times of tremendous change um, that ensure continuity over time. How can we think, for example, um, about why, how life chances um, are shaped by not the place that one lives to shift to how the material reality of unequal life chances are demonstrated geographically and produce then a historical geography over time that's reproduced, right? As others have emphasized the continued production in reproduction and why this shifting then helps us think about the relations of power that we're embedded within as political agents um, and what we fight for. So in and and what we might win um, and have yet to win. Um, so in my own kind of organizing and research, I focus on how this helps us think about questions of race and inequality in education, the limits of liberal rights to inclusion, um, and particularly also what these rights do to reproduce structures of dominant power. How do they mark a gap between what was fought for and what was won? Um, and in particular, also how they uh, work to, how they grow out of um, thinking about a key set of contradictions that we confronted that I with others in um, an organization I was part of called the Center for Immigrant Families, confronted in um, organizing um, in uh, New York City around gentrification, public school choice and segregation. Um, so thinking about these contradictions led me to consider, for example, how in the post-Brown period, the structuring of universal rights to education came to be structured as individual private choices, right? Um, not the collective rights that people had fought for or envisioned or the broader transformations, right? And how this focus then on rights um, helps us see how the rights that we have, individual private choices, are guided by market logics that are animated by choice, right? Um, confirming then that the public realm is not only marked by a continuity of racial inequality, but is one through which racial inequality is produced, right? So it's not just about kind of managing inequality better, um, but it is through the public, through the rights that we have, through um, public goods and public systems that reproduce rights. And so one of the ways that I trace how this works is, or think about how this works, is how choice, again, as a mechanism of the market, guarantees individual freedom that is necessarily tied to the right to exclude Right. And so as critical race studies scholar Cheryl Harris teaches us, the right to exclude has functioned as consistently over time. One thing that hasn't changed is that the right to exclude has functioned as a common nucleus of both whiteness and private property, even as those definitions have changed over time. But the one thing that they've maintained is the capacity to exclude. And then, then the absence of the redistributive state to redistribute resources the structuring of individual rights as private choices ensured that substantial inequality became a neutral baseline, right? And this then helps us think about the excerpt from the film that we were asked to watch, how we think about the racial wealth gap, right? What is the baseline of the gap? Why does that not move? And the second way that I just wanna kind of share briefly that I think about this um, is how we come to then the question of um, thinking about what rights do at the level of social relations and what I what I frame as partition. Now I grew up as a child of, of uh, parents who were growing up in the aftermath of British, during and in the aftermath of British colonialism. So partition was something that I that I grew up hearing about and not hearing about. It was referenced as a border, a process, an analysis of colonial power, as tragedy, as loss, as violence. It was understood to both be illogical. It was a moment of race making that we're talking about, right? It was a moment through which uh, 
that was understood to be a logical, a social fact through which contingent histories were made and claimed. It was also a way through which power worked to enliven and mobilize difference, to articulate antagonistic racial logics that we see at work today, right? Um, and logics that came to then seem normal and that today we, we understand as always and forever, but weren't actually. And so if we think about then partition, not as just a physical border, right? Um, but also signifying the ways that we relate to each other, the political, legal, social structures that guide those relations and the sense that we make of those relations, right? Um, I also think then about the ways that rights guided by individual private choices confirm and not only confirm and anticipate inequality, but also make us understand that uh, kind of looking out for ourselves, right, um, is the only way we can go. Um, looking out for ourselves and those who we understand um, ourselves to belong to, right? Um, and so here, kind of as people navigate whether it's school choice or other choices in a under in a system that is understood to always be kind of naturally unequal and maintain some kind of um, inequality, um, we can then see how a particular myopia right um, comes to uh, dominate, where we understand that even within public infrastructures. Two, public, two goods like education that might inculcate an idea of mutuality, of collectivity, come to be dominated by individualism, increased individualism, increased social separateness, right? Um, and my friend Paula Rojas has a good way of kind of talking about this. She talks about the cop not only being in our head, but in our heart. And so by extension, then we can think about um, the idea of racial capitalism is alive in our heads and hearts, ensuring that the way that Marx talked about it, right, in reference to private property, that we come to recognize in one another, not the, not the expansion of our own freedom, but just the limits to it, right? Producing the opposite then of what Cedric Robinson talked about as an ontological totality, right? Um, and that is foundational to the Black radical tradition. So this circumscribing of relations, right, um, it works both kind of then at the structural level of racism, right, but also through the, uh, through the ways that we understand, through the ideological, through the sense that we make, through the cultural logics that we enact, inhabit, and reproduce. Um, and so we're not just invested. So then we become invested in reproducing the logics of racism that we're then subject to, um, is how I would put it. Um, but we're not. That's not the entirety of it. There are kind of other ways of fighting for. But I think we have to see kind of clearly what we're fighting for and the limits of again kind of liberal rights to inclusion um, uh, before we begin to imagine an alternative. So we, it's, again, very much connected to the allegory, one of the ways in which we see how we've structured conversations or ideas about race and equality and framing them as about individual choices, right, um, uh, becomes one of the ways in which it becomes naturalized and one of the ways in which it uh, gets used to explain um, particular disparities and um, and to make them seem as though they're the result, number one, of choice, um, as though they're the result of, of things naturally occurring without any structures causing those things to occur. Um, and um, I also think that it very much ties to the games, too, because it's also giving you, it's also the host telling you um, why you've lost the particular game as well. Here are the, here are the explanations for why you've lost at the particular game. keep game. losing. And why you keep losing and why you keep losing. So what are, uh, let, let's, um, there's some, I, I want to, well, let's, uh, there's some questions, interesting questions that I think you might want to talk about here. Like um, somebody asked, why is black skin so central to the practice of racism? I want to diverge a little bit and ask that question. Um, and and uh, another one, if, if the definition of race keeps changing over time, 
and geography, why do people still believe in race as something immutable and real? And then we'll get to talk about how do people really engage in conversations, those difficult conversations, interactions with people around race and racism. Any initial thoughts? Sure, I'll, I can jump in, but um, I, please, fellow panelists, please feel free to jump in. I think those two questions are related. I think one of the things you have to realize with any kind of form of power is that any form of power is always human produced and it wants to present itself as being something that you cannot fight against. And the best way to do that is to present itself as natural and unchanging. And so if you look at the way and the logic of trying to make race appear as if it is something that cannot be challenged, the first way to do it was to use religion as a way of Shaving them. So you have European powers using sort of the story of Ham and other biblical stories of curse of Ham as a way to say the reason why Black people and Natives, Indigenous peoples are in the position that they are in is because God ordained it. And so you, you, you use a, an authority, religion, as a way for people not to challenge it, right? Then as biology became to be the primary science and science became the primary form of producing knowledge, it overtook religion. And so the logic of making something seem natural and un uncontestable was to place it in the realm of science and biology, right? And so the focus on black skin in particular is to say we can visually distinguish between different groups just by looking at the skin. What way to what more what easier way to do it than just to look at black skin? But even and so the logic of trying to contest race as biological then occurred in the realm of science. People looked at DNA find, of course, that there's nothing biological linking Black people. There's no racial gene, right? You can find racial DNA between peoples from all over the world. There, there's a very, very infinitesimally, not even people in the African continent share DNA, lots of DNA. It's, there, there isn't any biological basis, right? There's nothing. So the idea of what constitutes Black skin is itself but I think it's overlooked in itself a social uh, argument. Well, what is black skin? Because people who have black skin don't even, there's a whole range of folks who are black who have different shades of black skin. And yet, so that even that itself, right, is not a as natural condition, is not a natural condition as what people think it is, right? Um, and then secondly, about this, why is it, why is it uh, the definition of race change or people, if the immut immutability, that goes to centering power. The whole point of, of race is a power relation is that you enforcing the idea that it cannot be challenged, that the power at its most uncontestable, at its most sort of resigned, is that when you don't even raise a, an, uh, an argument against it, you don't even think about it as something that you even can consider to contest, right? It's just something that's part of your life. To use a phrase from political theories, it is common sense, right? But there is a lot of work, a lot of effort to make something common sense. Right. At the very point when someone says, oh, this is a common sense thing, that is when your ears should perk up, your brain should light, and you should begin to interrogate and think about it. This comes from political theorist Stuart Hall, who took this from Antonio Gramsci, right? Thinking about um, any kind of situation in which some would call something. So this, I want to lay that out for you. I, I, I think that, that some of this can be put in more... Um, immediate political terms, um, you could say that uh, the United States was founded on slave labor and native land. Um, and it was founded then on white over red and black. And white was constituted as what's not red and black. And then, and, and that it is continually America equated with white is continually refounded by stipulating what it's not. And that not can, can take many different forms. Um, but what, what seems so important to me is that um, there have been moments in our history where the connection between democracy and whiteness in America really in other words, the use of race justified exclusion and inequality, but there have been moments when it when that was challenged. Um, not just the Civil War, but especially the two reconstructions, the one after the Civil War and the one 
that I, I would say the second reconstruction during the long 60s era. And um, you saw an effort to establish a multi-racial or multi-cultural democracy in which whiteness was in some way displaced. Um, and what's so interesting in, in thinking about, about Jean-Pierre's Jean, Jean game is that, I mean, in American history, there have been all these immigrant groups, Irish, uh, Italian, Jews, Slavic, Asian. And the question all throughout American history is, can they become white? Will they be redefined? Initially, they're defined as not white, and they're closely, proximately identified with blackness, with the non-white. But in many cases, some cases, there is an ability to pass, not because these people are actually lighter or darker, but because of a whole set of ideological struggles over whether they can be qualified as white. And in our day, people of Asian origin, people of Hispanic origin, there's a real question about where they're going to stand in kind of the racial hierarchy. And are they going to identify or seek to be included by acquiring whiteness, or are they going to identify as critical, as critics of that? And it seems to me that that's a big part of what our politics has been over the last 40 years, uh, along with a real backlash, really, against the effort to open up democracy to uh, so that it's not equated uh, with whiteness. And the moment we're in is an acute moment because the historic founding of America uh, in white over black is or white over indigenous is being repeated. Uh, we are seeing an effort to re, again, renew a kind of founding uh, uh, white or racial nationalism in this country. And I think that's a big part of what the larger phenomenon of Donald Trump is about. It's not, he's not an original, it's not unique, it is, he's not an anomaly. He is playing on real themes in the culture about the definition of what membership in this nation means and who's eligible for it, who, who, who can benefit from it. Um, as recently as him uh, attacking Nikki Haley uh, for not being really American, uh, the way he attacked Obama for not being really American. So there's something in this definition of of um, of this game and what the rules are and who can play that is really potent right now. Thank you all so much. So we have a a question um, a question uh, in the audience that I think really gets to our next next one of the next issues of discussion. So the person asked, in today's politically charged climate in the USA, uh, with the so-called red states enacting laws, getting rid of civil rights gains, banning books written by people of color, denying the true effects of slavery, and demonizing people who are different, how is this country going to survive this attack by the so-called um, uh, evangelicals, as, as, as what the question says? And so really, in some ways, like now that we have this richer understanding of race, and racism, we understand how the various complex ways in which racism is operating. How do we use the lessons that we've gained from this session to combat racism in, in all of its forms? And um, Sarah, I know you in particular are engaged in this work every day. And so you wanna yeah, give us some insights there? Um, absolutely, it is a constant battle. Um, I wonder if I can sort of take us out of the academic space and place us at the dinner table. Um, <laughs> either the either the dinner table or maybe your workplace cubicle. Uh, I know we have probably a various different types of audience here today from the academic space, from non-academia. And I really wanna speak towards um, how we can move this conversation forward outside of academia. I do have an academic background. I have a master's in creative writing. Something that I found, though, while in the academic space, and of course, this is a generalization, but I find there's a lot of, yes, 
yes, yes, yes, right? Um, everyone sitting around a table and agreeing with each other. You're not really able to convince the folks that are sitting next to you at your collegiate room because chances are they have the same exact opinion as you. Um, of course, a generalization, but I find that it's harder to make progress there when folks are already so aware, they've already read the books. What happens though is, what about all of these students that go home to that dinner table with their parents? Um, and I'll just go ahead and and make this abundantly, I guess, political, go home to those red states, right? That are enacting these harmful laws and voting in these harmful ways. What is, I think there's a disconnect with how folks who are, how folks are able to communicate with folks who disagree with them, who might even be our own parents, who might be our siblings, our cousins, our, our grandparents, sheesh, our grandparents. Um, <laughs> so as I am also mixed race and as someone who grew up mixed, I'm, I've always felt like I was pulled into these conversations and people in the room who grew up wildly different from each other although both immigrants Mexican immigrants and and Jewish immigrants on on either side of me but always pulled into these political disagreements racial disagreements um and so I think something as I entered into the DEIB space that I had to work through and that I found to be helpful is learning that shame is not a motivator um, I'm a pretty outspoken person. Um, I always thought, hey, if I just if I just spit facts at people, they'll they'll feel horrible and they'll just change their mind, right? If I say to someone, oh, well, did you know that there's only two Latina CEOs of Fortune 500 companies ever? Do you think that's fair? Or I mean, I could just sit here all day, right, and just and talk about case studies and talk about facts and talk about statistics and numbers, but that doesn't really motivate people, uh, maybe a very, very few percentage of people. And if you think about it, if you think about shame and blame and what it does to the body, right? It's an isolator. Shame actually lowers the gaze. It curls the shoulders down and it hunches the body over, right? When we feel ashamed. But if we want to imbue solidarity in our communities, we need to lift those shoulders up we need to go outwards. We need to align our gaze, right? Look into each other's eyes and see each other, right? As as Gen Z and millennials would say, feel seen, right? And, and hear from each other in our stories. I love that Jean-Pierre told an allegory because as someone with a creative writing background, I think the way forward here um, is is storytelling right is being able to share your story or other stories and i also believe that representation really does matter you know seeing different races in prominent media and spaces where they haven't normally been seen i do think makes a difference it starts those conversations it's a gateway into allowing someone to have that aha moment and say, oh my God, I never thought about that before. And that reminds me of that, of this aspect of myself, right? And when someone can see a little bit of themselves in someone, I think that's where we can come together and understand each other. Um, and I guess one more note I'll say on this is, okay, we're at the dinner table, right? And we're feeling emotional and we're feeling heated. I, I, I get emotional, I don't know, I'm a Pisces, not that I'm really into that, but right? My, my emotions run hot, right? I get angry quickly. Um, but I think something that I've had to really learn, especially in the DEIB space, um, is really leveraging, the, uh, Marshall B. Rosenberg wrote a book just uh, called The non Nonviolent Communication Principles um, about really being able to effectively communicate with someone, especially someone who you don't agree with. And so, and and myself being a reactive person, I've found that that's been very helpful to pause, to listen, to ask questions, something that we use in the workplace, because I also give um, DEI workshops and trainings to various different uh, you know, places. 
we use the three whys. It sounds simple, but even like a baby, you know, why, 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 right? That's actually very helpful in facilitating understanding and get someone to relax and really open up to you. Um, and also to employ media. Um, there's a recent Netflix show that got me in a very interesting conversation recently with someone who, again, never really thought about race before. Um, it, it's called You Are What You Eat. It just it popped up on my Netflix for you thing. And there's a really interesting part that actually talks about environmental racism. Very brief. But believe it or not, that little brief seed was enough to get some of my family members or, or family friends to actually think about something they've never had to think about before. In this instance, I'll briefly share, I know I'm, I'm going on here, but it briefly speaks about CAFOs, which are concentrated animal feeding operations, right? And that's where a lot of our cheap meat comes from, right? These big factory farms. And all of the folks, most of the folks, I think it's like 96% of the folks who live around these factory farms are black and brown folks that have been there since pre, you know, Civil War era, right? And most of the workers working in these extremely dangerous um, jobs and positions are predominantly Hispanic. So even just that little seed of info, believe it or not, actually gets folks to take a step back and in their media, they're just watching Netflix at night, are able to, you know, they're not reading necessarily the books that that other folks are reading, but media um, is a great way to bring in that conversation. And someone was able to turn to me at that dinner table and say, Sarah, you do that DEI thing. I don't really know what it is, but I was watching You Are What You Eat. And they said this crazy thing, is that, you know? And then that's where the conversation goes from there. Um, I have more I could say, but I'll stop there. Um, and, and yeah. Sarah, tell us a little bit, do people wanna know how do they engage in these conversations particularly across generations? So how do people interrupt? How do they uh, how do they interrupt in a way that allows people to hear them and to listen to them? And as uh, as George put in there, how 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 can you explain? Um, can you know how do we get people to understand that they're um, insisting upon their various conceptions of race despite every fact to the contrary, as you both pointed out? Yeah. So I know as I was gabbing on, I haven't been able to look at the the chat. Um, and I know I'm supposed to be, you know, an expert on this, I'm in the space, but I'm still learning this myself, right? And I'm still on this journey myself. But again, I think what it goes back to is I really believe in storytelling. Um, I think a way to have this, this, these difficult conversations is to use I statements um, <laughs> that just go, that's therapy 101 for communication. But I do think really a lot of um, what, DEIB is that people just see the D and the D is what's politicized, um, but they forget about the IB. They forget that the IB, and for folks, uh, I should also just, uh, D is the diversity, right? And for folks who, this is a new term for them, um, anybody who might be listening, EI, right? So equity and inclusion, and now we have the B for belonging, right? Um, and I think in order to have folks feel like they are in, in, included and belong is to be able to tell their story um, and to listen to other stories. And again, I think media makes a big difference. Um, I was gonna save this a little bit more towards the end, but I think one of the biggest things is send that person a podcast episode, send that person a show to watch. Maybe that's the gateway into that difficult conversation. If you keep butting heads and disagreeing in something that you vehemently believe in and that person feels vehemently um, opposite from you and it feels violent, maybe a way to go into it is have someone else, whether it be through the voice of a movie or a podcast or a TV show, um, be able to help you in your conversation and to and to give that um, boost to what you have to say. But as far as how not to interrupt and how to actually have the conversation, I'm still learning that myself. Um, but I, I do recommend Marshall Rosenberg's Nonviolent Communication Principles. Um, th um, you can read about de-escalation practices, even something as simple as a deep breath, regulating your heartbeat. Um, all of those things, believe it or not, are extremely powerful tools in having difficult conversations and just speaking to someone who simply doesn't agree with you. 
Um, I, I would say that those are my initial tips there. My, my experience teaching is to ask, I mean, I think this goes back to SNCC organizing in the South. You ask people questions. Why do you see the world the way you do? And that involves them telling stories and being heard. And when in, in, in uh, political organizing, and I don't mean just organizing in the Deep South years ago, I mean, the deep canvassing work that's happening in Texas and Virginia and North Carolina now in efforts to try to flip these state houses, talking to white people, the deep canvassing involves going and and getting them to start talking and they learn if they can start talking as opposed to just kind of the echo chamber through Fox. They end up having relations with these canvassers who have to have the fortitude and the patience to actually sit with them um, uh, until they start to unspool and unfold their stories. But I think, so storytelling to me goes in all directions, I guess. And I, I think a lot about, I don't know if it's possible to reach the 40% of the population that is now kind of enclosed in this Fox universe. I don't know if they're open to persuasion. I mean, it seems to me that is a politically arguable question now, but if some 10% of them could be peeled off because they're not as invested as others, then that effort would, would be enough to actually get um, um, a, a a better a different democracy across the across the finish line. <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah, great. I want to go back to a little bit to what Sarah said about shame is not a motivator, and that that shame is actually an isolator. It hunches us over. We're, our gaze is down, and we really need to be looking at each other. But in some ways, talking about the various conversations, and I and I agree that shame is not a motivator, but. And some uh, part of the discourse in this country right now is people are saying that um, that I feel shame just simply from learning actually fuller, richer, realer histories, right? So part of the um, the arguments under the divisive concepts bills or the anti CRT bills was that um, our children feel shame from learning about these various histories. And so how do we both? not um, uh, create the kind of shame that will not be a motivator, but really engage people in the realities of our world and um, our, our history, our present, our you know, future, all of those things. I mean, I guess I want to jump in and ask what, you know, I think the storytelling is so important, right? Um, but I think the example of thinking about SNCC and thinking about kind of the attacks on CRT then, at, or questions of inclusion in different spaces are really different ones, right? Because um, they are kind of grounded in different political objectives. Um, so I'm wondering, like, then, how are we thinking about, you know, is what is a political objective? How do we shift the question to what is the political objective of the attacks on CRT, right? What are they trying to do in that instance? What is the long game? What's the short game? How are they connected? And then how do we engage? Right? Um, because I don't think um, not, you know, making everybody feel comfortable, in my opinion, would then in that context of the example you're giving, Angela, right, of the attacks on CRT, but that would not lead us to a beneficial or helpful political um, outcome, right? Um, so I think in thinking about kind of, but I think in some of the examples you're giving, Sarah, that is really kind of helpful to think about kind of how do we transform a space? How do we transform relationships? Or George, in terms of thinking about kind of, yeah, how do we make people who might only see themselves through the common sense kind of ways that you were talking right. about, Jean-Claude, uh, uh, Jean-Pierre, um, uh, think about kind of themselves differently or have different stories to tell, right, um, about themselves or see their kind of circumstance differently. So I think, I think really kind of thinking about then the political context of shame, of 
inclusion, right? The limits of both, right? Uh, as well as we've kind of been taught, but then our political context and what our objective is can then guide the stories, guide the context, guide kind of how we're trying to destabilize the common sense um, that we're given every day by not by Fox, but also by the New York Times. Um, and to what extent, right? To what end? Thank and you I think, so much. Oh, Jean Pierre, did you want to say something? Yes, if if I may, just briefly. Um, and I, and I really love this this discussion around storytelling, particularly around the idea of building up a counter narrative, in the sense that, um, you know, and to this question of shame, I think one of the things that we should guide us is about telling truth to power. Right, we would, part of the storytelling should be exposing power, and that inquires telling a kind of counter narrative. So, for example, you know, histories of capitalism will look to the, the beginning of capitalism in Europe, right? And the factories of Europe as a low post looking to the factories of the Americas, the plantations, right? Or looking at the development of freedom in the U.S. without talking about slavery. Um, you know, my advisor used to say that we have won the war but lost the peace. And what did he mean by that? After the Civil War, the South, particularly Confederates, organized to tell a particular story about slavery and the role of slavery in American life to represent the re reconstruction as a failure. And Du Bois's masterful work, Black Reconstruction, and the last chapter of Propaganda of History is essentially a call for a retelling, a retelling of the story of America, right? A counter narrative about the way Reconstruction created a new moment for multiracial democracy, right? What we need to do as part of the work is to re narrate the story of the US so that we can tell a future story about America that is different than the one. And so much of what is currently happening, what you can call a political conjuncture, right? A sort of meeting of different moments. We are in the moment of neoliberalism. We are in a moment of the attack on DEI and uh, undermining affirmative action around voting rights and abortion, right? But also this way of individualizing politics and this atomization. This attempt to sort of create this, you know, the, the Margaret Thatcher. There are, there are no such things as, as society, but individuals and families, right? And we need to tell a story about doing things in common. We need to tell a story about political power that is about building community. We need to think about different kinds of futures, but that requires a counter narrative. And to use a phrase from a, a, a kind of a very insightful book, you know, provincializing Europe. We need to provincialize the story that the, the folks who are attacking DEI are doing. We need that story is the story that's masking power. That's a story to return to a different era of the US, right? But we need to tell a future oriented story to give people an idea that, to imagine different possibilities, but that requires a different history of a retelling of the of U.S. history, a retelling of world history, right, and place in the U.S. in a particular context. I, I think we could retell American history in as strident and self-righteous and dogmatic a way as Fox News tells their history. Uh, and we could marshal more facts, but we could uh, tell what we would consider a truer story in a way that will be as off-putting as um, uh, a, a Christian missionary in Africa. Um, and when, when I think about, now it may be that if you could rely on demographics, there'll be more of us than of this dwindling number of white people um, uh, in the next 30 years. But if, if politics is at all to involve some kind of persuasion, I don't think it's just us giving a counter narrative. I think something else is required in the sense of, I mean, I think Americans are crazy. I think they're really crazy and that they live in a dream. The woke stuff, it's, it's dream language. It's charged, symbolic, talk about allegories. Um, uh, child sex trafficking rings. 35% of the American people believe that the Democratic Party is engaged in child sex trafficking, okay? So now, it, how, how do we understand that? Or do we just ignore it? Uh, simply telling a counter story doesn't seem to me, it makes, doesn't really, wouldn't, doesn't seem rhetorically effective to me unless the story is addressed to the issues that are, Freud would call them the latent issues that are being 
expressed in the manifest and manifestly crazy content that we see in this country. Um, but to get to the latent issues involves actually talking to people and sort of trying to understand what's really driving them. The fear and the terror, the anxiety, the, the, the phobia, uh, it seems to me that now maybe the best thing is just to ignore all of that and say that's too centered on white people anyway, and they are crazy, so forget about it. But there's, but I, I mean, I take that as a totally valid argument, mind you. But, but it seems to me that simply saying counter narrative doesn't, it, it only, it, it just, it, it, it too readily simply reconstructs sort of two clashing paranoid systems, which maybe that's really the best we can do. And they mobilize their people and we mobilize ours and we slug it out. Um, but right. I mean, that's how I wonder what what's going to happen next. Right. So speaking of mobilization, I want to work. We're coming to the end of our program. I want to give every each one of you a minute to share with our audience any kind of actions, any things that they should take from the program, any any steps they can take in order to um, to make our society better, <laughs> to combat racism. And um, then we'll move into the Q&A. So Uju first. Um, okay, so building off of kind of thinking about race and power, right? In the aftermath of the murder, the police murder, uh, murdering of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, um, we saw a growing movement calling for the defunding of police prisons, um, uh, which have grown to not just be police and prisons, but in fact, the entire ecosystems of our society. Um, and in that moment, the idea that budgets or moral documents became pretty popular, right? Um, so I think we can think about um, where those moral documents direct us today, right? Um, around the continued production of race, the divestment investment, right? Um, that it can point to where premature death is kind of continued to be constructed, group differentiated premature death, and where it indicates that some lives are precious. Um, and on that note, I wanna take a minute. I know where I'm not doing this as a formal panelist, but as a person of conscience, again, as somebody whose parents grew up under British colonialism who were made to be refugees. Um, and as a person who lives, um, again, of conscience in the heart of empire here in the United States, um, I feel a moral and ethical weight um, to say that our fight against racism here must be connected understandably and always to fighting US imperialism and the ongoing genocide in Palestine, because our struggles are not only similar, but as my friend and comrade Nadine Neighbor says, they are interwoven, they are interlinked, um, just as is our liberation. So I'm part of an organization called Insight Palestine Force, um, that link there's a network of radical feminists of color that bridges organizings rooted in um, abolition feminism anti-imperialism and gender justice um, i'll put the link in the chat if anybody wants to connect or learn more we would have welcome you to um but again thinking about again what those moral what those moral documents tell us again about the reproduction of race and racism here where we might fight it, where those pressure points might be, and how we fight it also as it circulates across the globe. Um, that would be my... Uh, Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, Jean-Pierre, one minute. Sure. Thank you. So I, what I will say is if you all could uh, go to the njreparationscouncil.org to find out more about reparations and why reparations. I think many of you will think of reparations simply as maybe cash payments, as a backwards looking thing, as something that is, you know, anachronistic. But really, the way in which we think about the council and many other folks think about reparations as a future-oriented project to fundamentally answer the question, what does it take for Black people to be free, not only in New Jersey, but in the U.S. and in the world? And so we're trying to answer that question with our reparations council to do something that is, in some ways, for some folks, a kind of radical intervention, which is to link the past, the harms of slavery, and what, hates, what slavery wrought, including Jim Crow, and ongoing institutional racism and come up with repair. And repair means there are more moral and ethical dimensions. There are political dimensions. 
economic, environmental. And I do want to point out that Dr. King was a supporter of reparations. And Dr. King also was a trumpet of conscience. And he, in doing so, he also believed in calling out the evils of American imperialism, militarism, right, imperialism. And he also was against the Vietnam War at a time when it was not very popular. And so I just want to, you know, point out Dr. King's moral integrity, his political integrity, at a time when he was called out by many others, including other civil rights advocates, with lent linking to what was going on in the U.S. to the world. So I just want to raise up the radical king, the king in the wilderness, um, and his and his moral and, and integrity and his vision. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. Would you... Yeah, sure. Um, I I'll leave. Uh, I'll leave this by saying, um, you know, I, I work for Consciously Unbiased. Uh, I, I would love to give them a shout out. If anyone is listening to this and is also thinking, ah, I'd love to have more workplace DEI training and things like that, you can look us up at Consciously Unbiased. But also, we I kind of helm our podcast, which is a wonderful podcast called Break the Bias. Um, you know, we have everyone on there from like Reshma Saujani, who's the founder of Girls Who Code, listening to her story and um, things like that. So Break the Bias is a great podcast. But also, I'll just say this again, um, try to speak to someone on purpose that you don't agree with, or someone who's different from you, or someone who you think is, is as George said, crazy, right? Try to actually have a conversation with someone who has a very opposing view to you. I want to challenge you to that. Um, and and maybe bring them to a poetry reading. Maybe bring them along with, don't tell them it's a poetry reading, right? <laughs> um, I, we all probably know some of these folks, whether it's a colleague or something. Um, you know, I run a poetry reading series called Jersey City Reads Poems, and most of my readers of are folks of color. Um, hardly, I hardly had a reading without, right? Because... Um, that's the community here in Jersey City. Bring someone along to one of those readings if you're local, right? And and I think exposure um, and awareness is really important. And one last thing was with my last 20 seconds here is I'll say, if you encounter someone who is sort of speaking against DEI, the thing I would say is this just occurred to me the other day, and I was listening to a Huberman Lab podcast episode about gut health. And the very first thing he said in this podcast episode is, when explaining the definition of a healthy gut, what doctors define as a healthy gut is a diverse, diverse, diverse microbiome, right? The diversity is what defines the healthy gut. So let's apply that, right? Let's let's apply that and we can be a stronger society and a healthier one and a smarter one and a more innovative one by being more diverse. We need different voices and different perspectives. So. You can maybe use that, maybe not in those in those conversations you might have. Thank you so much, Sarah. And finally, George. Uh, I guess I want to say a good word for art and poetry as being vehicles for people to become more self-reflective wherever they are starting from. And in my teaching, I've always found especially James Baldwin as yeah. being one of the greatest kind of occasions and spaces, his texts, his stories, his personal witness um, um, as uh, enabling people to actually um, face things that do make them ashamed and things that also make them enraged and uh, traumatized and across all kinds of differences. And lastly, that the question of races is, as uh, Jean-Pierre and Uju said, it's connected to everything else. And it's really a mistake to separate it out. We have time for one question. Um, so I'll, I'll ask one question, one last question, very interesting. Can racial identity be a source of pride for oppressed people without reifying the social construct that supports racism? 
I mean, I'll just say real quick, I believe so. I mean, I think it's how we understand, right? So we can look to the example of the Black British movement as an example. That was a way for formerly colonized people to come together and say to the British, you see us all as Black, so we're going to take the political identity of Black and make it into something powerful, but also connecting, right? The counter kind of narrative that you're referring to, Jean-Pierre, right? Um, but a powerful political one with a clear objective um, that was also challenging, that was reconnecting histories, right? But not from the colonizer's lens, but from kind of below and to challenge dominant power. So I think that's one, one example we could look to. And I just want to just piggyback off that. That's incredibly important. This notion of blackness um, as being uh, centered around anti-colonial, anti-slavery, right? As you pointed out, people, uh, South Asians, people after descent were organized under the under the banner of blackness in formerly um, British colonies, but even in the Haitian constitution, right? Blackness is defined by its anti-slavery, anti-colonial. Anti so even Polish people um, were considered black because they had organized against slavery. The Mau Mau, right? Uh, those, so when the British, so, you know, in Malaysia would rail against the, the, those who were anti, the most anti-imperial, those who could not be reconciled with imperialism were called black, right? People would take up that category and organize in the category because blackness could not be reconciled with colonialism with imperialism. And so you see circuit part of black power was for people around the globe of African descent, but also who are colonized to take up blackness as a political category through which they could organize. And so I think retelling the, the story of blackness through that lens is particularly powerful because it wasn't linked to biology and it wasn't linked to the history of the colonizers, but a way of organizing politics. Politics, exactly. Thank you all so much. Thank you for being here and signing in on this program. Thank you to the panelists for your wonderfully amazing, <laughs> brilliant insights. I would say to use Sarah's words there, the diverse insights that we've learned on this panel have left us all with a healthy gut. Um, and with that, I'm going to pass the mic on to Donna. Thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you, Angela, for moderating this really important discussion and panelists. Thank you for your time and your expertise. I can tell from the chat, there's a lot of things you gave uh, our audience to think about. It, and that's the purpose of standing on solidarity as well as action steps. Uh, so just in wrapping up, I'd like to invite everyone who's on the call to join us this Friday as we celebrate the artistry and music of Max Roach. Uh, it's a program called Freedom Now Sweet, and we'll be celebrating Max Roach's centennial performance. And that'll be followed by a private post-show reception. Um, and we, of course, as you saw in the opening slides, we have a plethora of events for you to enjoy, including our jazz jams, our dance workshops, um, and of course, what's happening on our main stage. But I have exciting news. Um, we will be hosting in-person panel discussions, standing in solidarity, and film screenings here at NJPAC, uh, so that uh, starting in March, our next uh, Standing of Solidarity is March 4th. The title is A Tree of Life, Uprooting Hate Through Interfaith Actions. And the event will be in person uh, at NJPAC at the, in the Chase Room. And uh, I extend a special invitation to all of you, our loyal audience, to come and let's see each other. Um, so that will be great. So starting in March, uh, we will have in person. Uh, and there'll still be a few virtuals but we really want to have everyone in the same space so we can deepen our conversation. So everyone, please have a wonderful evening and let's take away some of these great initiatives that we were uh, given this evening so we can transform our communities. Thank you so much.